Hi everyone, I'm Sarah McDooling and today we are celebrating the Song of Achilles Day. In honour of this special event, I am extremely excited and honoured to be joined by beloved and best-selling author Madeline Miller. Welcome Hi. Madeline. Thank you so much. I am so thrilled to be here. Hello to everyone in Australia, to everyone all over the world. Thank you all so much for joining us today. And thank you to Booktopia for making this all happen. Oh, no, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm super honored to meet you. I'm a really big fan. Um, we'll just give people a few moments to join the live fan q and I'd also like to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional owners and first storytellers of the Gadigal land where I'm recording from today and to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. We're going to be live for about half an hour or so, although um, it depends on how many questions I'm allowed to get in. I've got a lot of things I want to ask you and we've got a lot of people who've sent in some amazing questions to ask you. So um, if you're watching, just take your comments and questions below and maybe there'll be one of the ones that gets asked. And remember, you can celebrate the Song of Achilles Day with us using the hashtag, the Song of Achilles Day. So to get the ball rolling, um, I just have a few questions of my own that I would love to ask you before we start reading out um, other people's questions. So to begin with, um, did you ever imagine, it's, it's now been 10 years since the Song of Achilles was published, would you ever have thought that 10 years later you'd still be doing interviews about it and it would be this massive of a big selling novel a decade later? Not at all. <laughs> Not <laughs> at all. Um, when, you know, when they sent me the special edition, I feel like I had to just hold it in my hands and think, you know, I never thought I would get one book published, let alone a book that would, you know, still be finding readers 10 years later that would have a special edition that, I mean, all of that was just completely beyond the realm of my imagination. I, I felt like if three people read the song of Achilles when it came out and, you know, responded to it, I would have felt happy. <laughs> well, it, three people many, many, many times over. <laughs> Um, I, I'm a big fan of retellings, but I always wonder, you know, and particularly in your case, as someone who's been the scholar who studied and researched the myth um, and is now, and then the writer who uses them as inspiration for a new story, are you ever torn between those, knowing as much you do as, about the mythology? Is it difficult to take these legendary characters into your own hands? Absolutely, absolutely. Particularly with Song of Achilles, because I, I was just learning how to do that. I, I was really kind of practicing it for the first time. And I was coming from an academic background where I had been, you know, writing about these characters from an academic standpoint, which I also find academic writing very creative as well. But, you know, you're not supposed to change things. You're supposed to support your points and, you know, work with what's there. Um, and so I was very anxious every time there was sort of a conflict between where I felt my vision going and you know what the text actually said. And it took a long time to kind of give myself permission to let go of things. Um, one of the scenes I struggled with so much in Song of Achilles was the very first scene of the Iliad when sort of my book finally catches up with the Iliad. It was a scene I knew really well in the Greek. I had studied it so much. And um, in the Iliad, this is kind of a spoiler, sort of, but not really because I changed it. Um, but anyway, in the Iliad, uh, Agamemnon and Achilles get into this huge fight. And Achilles has the impulse to kill Agamemnon, um, a very understandable impulse, I feel. And Athena grabs him by the back of the hair in the Iliad and prevents him. And I couldn't find a way to get Athena into the scene it just I kept right I kept hitting this brick wall and I was like but I can't take Athena out I mean I will literally that is the definition of hubris the lightning bolt you know I can't take her out and then it sort of slowly dawned on me as I was on like the 50th draft of the scene I think I have to take Athena out and you know I started having this huge anxiety about can I change it can I change it um, but eventually I was able to justify it to myself like, well, it's his, you know, it's his wisdom, it's his sort of super ego is telling him that maybe that wouldn't be a good idea. And so it's sort of his, you know, his, his internal Athena that, that stops him as opposed to an external Athena. But the truth is, if there are any of you out there who are working on your own adaptations, um, 
I think that was very silly of me to worry so much about that <laughs> because I, I think that, you know, ancient authors retold these stories in many dramatically different ways. And over the centuries, people have retold them in so many different ways. And how close you are to the original material is not a sign of, you know, how successful the adaptation is going to be at all. So, you know, if I could go back and speak to my younger self, I would say, stop worrying about that so much. <laughs> Don't worry about the hubris. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, then by Cersei, I was totally over it. I was like, I'm changing everything. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's really interesting. Interesting that it was just at the point where you hit the Iliad, where you suddenly were like, oh, these characters that I've been building up to this moment are suddenly in the familiar myth. Yes. Um, it must have been strange to like get outside the train track, sort of. Yeah. <laughs> it felt, um, it felt good once I once I leaned into it it felt good it felt I felt like you know now I can always tell when the scene has ground to a halt and I can't you know make it go it's there's a problem and I have to kind of re I, I've made a I've made a, a, a bad decision and I have to kind of retrace my steps well it it reads perfectly so <laughs> thank you <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you uh, now, I just want to ask some of the questions that have come through from um, the people watching. The first is from the bookworm botanist. And the question, and I love this question, is um, the ending of this book has potentially been felt a million different ways. When you finished writing the book, how did the ending make you feel? Um, I, I cried. I did cry. I had written a version of the ending that was really... Um, it just wasn't quite right. And it wasn't hanging together. And I was sort of, I didn't, I didn't quite have it. And I, I sort of thought, well, maybe, maybe I'm doing it all wrong. Do I need to have another character take over the narration? Um, and I really considered that. I thought about having Briseis take over the narration. I thought, thought about having Achilles take over the narration. Um, I wrote sort of very sketched out versions of those. And then I thought, this is completely wrong. I know whose story this is, and I know who needs to tell this story all the way through. And so I actually was staying with a friend um, and I sort of was up in, in the spare room and I kind of went into this trance state <laughs> where I wrote the whole ending all in one chunk. I can still see the room around me, but I felt like the, the, the ending was kind of floating up through the room <laughs> towards me. And I wrote it all in this, in this gush. And of course I edited it afterwards, but I felt like that moment of writing kind of carried, it needed to have a, a forward momentum emotion that I needed to sort of feel all the way through. So um, I, I cried at the end. And, and when I was finished with the whole book as a whole, not just that scene, but the whole thing, I felt, uh, I did, I felt a lot of grief saying goodbye to these characters. I had lived with them for 10 years, um, longer than 10 years even. And it was, it was very sad to get to that moment where, you know, I've written the last scene between the two of them that I'm ever going to write. I mean, Hearing you talk about it, I can't imagine the ending any other way. Um, it's it's fascinating. You kind of make me want to read all of your other versions. But I, <laughs> even without doing that, I can't imagine a better a better ending, a better final two sentences than we have um, at the end of the Song of Achilles. It's like pitch perfect. And also, I was crying when I read it as well. <laughs> um, we've, the next question is pretty much answered, but I do I'm, I am gonna. I am going to ask it because I think it's funny. Um, BP16 asked, did you cry as much writing this book as we did reading it? Was it just the ending that made you cry or did you have some weepy moments all the way through? Um, I, it was, it was mostly the ending. I doubt, I mean, I was incredibly emotionally invested in this story emotionally invested in the way that I would, you know, kind of buttonhole my friends and be like, let me tell you how, like, let me tell you about this really emotional feeling I'm having about Achilles and Patroclus. And it, it was, so I, I mean, it was harder to be more deeply invested in a story than I was in the story. I, I lived it. I felt like I dreamed about it. And it was a story that meant so much to me. And, and it was a story that, um, 
I, I really, you know, as I was trying to write this book, because when I started writing it, I didn't really know how to write a book. It was, you know, it took me 10 years. There were lots of moments where I just felt like I'd hit a brick wall. I couldn't get through it. I didn't know what I was doing. And I kept thinking, you know, I'm a teacher, I'm a theater director. Do I really have to write this book? You know, maybe, maybe I should just give up and, you know, do this other stuff that I also love. But I was so engaged in the story. I could not, it felt like, you know, giving up on my, you know, closest friend, like the friend of my heart, it felt like giving up on them. So I, I didn't, I didn't, you know, necessarily cry as I was writing the scenes, but these are characters that are so deeply rooted in me and that felt like, felt like a part of me. And it really comes through in the writing. And I feel like that's a large part of the reason so many people have connected with this story. Those emotions run through so strongly. Uh, so next question is from Tabitha Joy, and this is an interesting question. She would like to know what myth, legend or hero do you think doesn't get the attention their story deserves? Oh, what a good question. So, I mean, so many. And what's amazing is that even characters that have been told, you know, whose stories have been told many, many times, I feel like there's always room for a new take. Um, I would love to see, I mean, Cassandra's story has been told a lot of times, but I would love more Cassandra. I feel like her story is so resonant. Talk about a story that just echoes down through the millennia um, of, you know, this woman who's trying to, trying to, to speak and no one will listen to her. I feel like that that is something that, you know, women have dealt with and the sexual assault part of that, of that story is just, I mean, I feel like that story is so powerful. Um, I also feel like, you know, you could take literally any any small character, any character at all, and make them the center of a novel. Um, I would love to see more Medusas out there. <laughs> um, but, you know, a lot of these are, are characters that have also gotten a certain amount of attention, but I, I'm always excited to read, to read their stories. Um, I would love to see characters that are... Um, Andromache and Hector, I feel like those are, are two characters that personally, speaking of, you know, how sometimes it can be hard as someone who comes to these myths already loving them. Um, I kept trying to put Andromache and Hector into Song of Achilles, and then I kept having to cut them. Because of course, you know, there's only one significant interaction with Hector um, in the song that Patroclus has with, uh, with Hector and it's fatal, of course. And so, you know, I, they really didn't fit in a first person narration, they really didn't fit. Um, but I, I think they're such an interesting pair. I mean, I, I love to hear, I love it when people write, she's more of a historical figure than a mythological one. I love to hear people write about Sappho. Um, I keep hoping that we're gonna find more poems <laughs> out there <laughs> and be able to put them together again. So, you know, any, all. Excellent answer. <laughs> um, we've got another one here. This is a great question and it's something that I, I love talking about this. Um, this is from Chloe Gabriel X and she asks, who is your favorite Greek goddess? Oh, that's such a good question. <laughs> um, so growing up, I, I did love Athena. I, I really did. I think, you know, when I was a kid, she was the one that really resonated with me. And then I think Artemis came next, you know, who doesn't want to run around in the woods all the time and, you know, make their own rules up. Um, so those were two characters that I really kind of, when I first encountered the myths, I really responded to. Um, as I got older, and you'll see this reflected in my writing a little bit, particularly in Circe, I started to realize how awful most of the <laughs> Olympian gods are. They're sociopathic narcissists. <laughs> and so I moved away a little bit from, um, from, the, from the Olympian gods. And I mean, I think Circe, Circe is, is a character. I love, I love many of the nymphs. Um, I find them really interesting because they occupy this, this fascinating space where they're, they're gods, but they're kind of at the, the lowest of the low in the hierarchy. They're so low down that they're almost human. And so Thetis, writing the character of Thetis, I felt like led right into writing about Circe. And, you know, so I might, I might have to say, I might have to say Circe, um, although, you know, Persephone, given that that's what I'm working on right now, is, is really going to give her a run for her money, I think. I love that. I think 
as a young girl, when I was young, I was obsessed with Persephone. And then as I got older, I became more interested in like ones I hadn't seen in retellings as often, like Nemesis. I got oh, really yes. like, what a cool goddess. <laughs> and uh, the goddess of retribution and vengeance. Yes. <laughs> yes. But also after reading Circe, like I think that my answer would always be Circe. <laughs> like I just don't. <laughs> I mean, she has it all, right? She's a goddess and a witch. I mean, yes. the witch really the lions. It's hard to beat. Uh, okay, so now from Shania Reeves, we've got what drew you to Greek mythology in particular over all the different other types of mythology out there? Mm -hmm. um, I think, first of all, it was exposure. It was the first mythology that I really encountered, and it was because my mom started reading me little pieces of the Iliad and the Odyssey when I was a kid as bedtime stories. And I just completely fell in love with them. I, I was so interested in how real and vivid and kind of upsetting. It's actually very, I, I think it's kind of strange that we teach mythology to children because it's filled with, you know, bestiality and necrophilia and like all kinds of stuff that is completely inappropriate. And I had a book um, called Dallaire's Book of Greek Myths. I don't know if any of you had it growing up. And, you know, I read it and they cover the whole, for those of you who've read Circe out there, they cover the whole pacifier and the bull and the conception of the Minotaur, but they cover it in this like amazing way that as a kid, it just goes right over your head. But looking back on that book as a grown up, I was like, wow, they, they went for it. <laughs> like they said it. Um, so, but I, I think that it was part of that kind of grittiness, that disturbing edge that that made me very interested because it felt, you know, although there were all these gods and monsters, it felt really real. It felt like it was about parents and children and it felt like it was about heroism and courage and also folly and pride and rage and hurt and all, you know, all this stuff that felt incredibly vivid and real. And, you know, when I went out and, and then I had this wonderful Latin teacher who taught me Latin and also offered to teach me Greek. And once I could read the Iliad in the original Greek, that was sort of the end for me because the poetry was so gorgeous and so powerful and just, it just, you know, it was electrifying to me. And so once I could read the literature, then, you know, I knew that that was what I wanted to do. But if I had been exposed to, you know, there's so many incredible mythologies out there and, um, I wish I could read Old Norse. <laughs> I wish I had, you know, I, I wish I knew more about the Egyptian myths. I always loved those also as a child, although I didn't, you know, I felt like I couldn't access them in the same way. Um, so, you know, I, I think it was, it was just, that's what my mom happened to, happened to hand me. It was fated. Yeah. <laughs> I think uh, part of the reason, I've thought about this before, part of the reason I was drawn to mythology as a child is that when you are a kid who loves books and stories and fairy tales, there's something really enchanting about the thought that this is more real because people believed in this and they thought it was real. And so maybe it is real more so than other stories. So um, I totally, I totally get the uh, obsession with mythology. I really like, I think it's, I think it's universal, right? Um, but I've strayed off topic. There is a follow-up question with um, what drew you to Greek mythology from Kiara B who asks, do you think that one day you would potentially write Roman or Norse or any other type of mythology or do you plan to just uh, stick with Greek mythology? Um, I think I would have to be able to, to read the language, whatever it was. So definitely Roman on the table um, cause I, I love, you know, I love the Aeneid, Virgil's Aeneid. There's so much Roman poetry, um, and Roman literature that I, I love, but I, I would need to, I would need to know the language, <laughs> yeah. whatever it was. Um, my husband actually reads Old Norse. So I have a little bit of a, of a way in there, but, um, but I, I think for right now, I would probably stick to, to Roman and Greek. And just to go back to what you were saying, Sarah, I feel like part of what is so about that sort of the power of mythology is how it, it it's kind of the only thing that feels really big enough to contain our feelings. That, you know, as humans, we have these huge emotions 
And oftentimes, you know, they're funneled into this very small way of expressing them. But in myth, we get to be as big as we feel inside. Hugely epic, big stories. And always about like the biggest things, life and death and love, like, and war, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Lana Rose asks, what Greek myth character or story has taught you the biggest life lesson that is still relevant? in today's day and age, despite being scripted so long ago? Oh, wow. That is such a good question. Um, I, there are many, there are many. And I think that what I love most about the ancient literature and the ancient myths is that when I revisit them, I find something new and I learn something new. And, um, I used to love the Bacchae. It was one of my favorite tragedies. And it's about this sort of king who's trying to resist um, the religion of Dionysus, which is sweeping in. And I responded to it in this very particular way. I was, when I first read it, I was rooted for Pentheus. I was rooted for the king to, you know, Dionysus is trying to come in and take over and, he's, and all of that. And then I read a, um, this incredible play retelling of the Bacchae called Hurricane Diane um, by, by the playwright Madeline George. I love it. It's amazing. It's brilliant. It's so funny. Um, and it completely changed the entire way I looked at the Bacchae. And <laughs> now I kind of root for Dionysus. Um, and, you know, it, it really, part of what I love about mythology, I guess, is the fact that your perspective can always change. And that what you see in a myth the first time you read it may not be what you see in it the fifth time or the tenth time. They're they're like kaleidoscopes, you know, and they sort of they turn and they turn and they turn and they reveal, you know, a new picture every time. So um, there are myths that I hold I hold very close. I mean, I think I, I used to really respond to the to the myth of of Penelope. Um, when I was younger, because I loved how clever she was, and I loved her her trick with the loom and weaving, and how you sometimes, if you just wait and you stall and you plan, you can sort of, even though she's not as powerful as the suitors, she's able to kind of keep things going um, through this cleverness that she has. And now, you know, looking back, I sort of that that doesn't speak to me as much. I, I I I reach for other for other myths. So there isn't one that I that I return to. I feel like it sort of changes over time. The one that's really resonating with me. Well, the way that you described having a myth change for you is exactly what the Song of Achilles did for me. Oh. My exposure. I I studied the Iliad in uni, um, in university, and then. I sort of didn't think about it very much. And then I saw the movie with Brad Pitt. <laughs> and that is my that was my knowledge, like studying it in university and seeing that movie. And I would say that neither the study I did nor the nor that movie ever brought across to me that the story as a tragic love story. And that is how I will always see the story now after reading your book. I can't imagine it another way. Um, so Yes, you, you did that for me and many others. <laughs> um, oh, that is such an honor. Thank you. <laughs> now, we've got a story here, and I, sorry, a question here, and I love hearing authors answer this question, particularly authors whose work I love. Um, Katie Beadle Books asks, what advice do you give aspiring authors? Mm -hmm. um, I, I think read as much as you can. Um, read a wide variety of things, you know, any, anything. And read once a book that you love, read it as a reader, always, you know, enjoy it as a reader, but then read it again as a writer. And reading like a writer is sort of asking yourself, you know, if an, if an author made you cry, if a scene really moved you, if you felt terrified in a scene, ask yourself, how is the author doing that? Um, how are they making that happen? It's sort of like pulling the curtain back and trying to figure out, you know, how the special effects work. <laughs> and mm -hmm. um, I think doing that can be really, really powerful to just, you know, read books over and over and kind of try to understand how, how authors do them. At the same time, um, 
I loved reading books by writers on writing. So I've read a bunch of those and I definitely um, would recommend them. I, I just found them very helpful. You won't agree with everything that, you know, that's one of the most important things to understand is that as a writer, you're gonna have your own path and your own way of doing things. And every writer has their own path and their own way. And so, you know, sometimes you'll read like the 10 things that, you know, so-and-so writer says you must do to be a writer. And maybe I'll identify with five of them <laughs> or maybe it'll be eight, um, but it won't be all of them. And that's, and that's okay and that's normal. So, you know, if you're doing something a little bit, a little bit differently, that's also okay, but it, it can help to just kind of be in conversation with other writers. Um, I would also say, don't give up. You know, I grew up reading uh, stuff and, and assuming that writers sat down, my favorite writers sat down and maybe they did two drafts and then it was finished. Um, but writing is all about, you know, draft after draft after draft. The first draft is always terrible. I mean, maybe there are genius writers out there who can write a perfect first draft. But I feel like, you know, all the writers I know, the first draft is bad. Oftentimes the second draft is bad. Maybe even the 10th draft is bad. But every time you sit down and you kind of put your hands in the story and you put your hands on the manuscript, you're gonna be learning. Even if you don't progress in a linear fashion, that was one of the, the things I had to train my mother not to ask me is please don't ask me how many pages I wrote today because the answer might be I threw out 50. Um, you know, it's not a linear thing. And throwing out those 50 pages might be exactly what the manuscript needed and exactly what I needed to release an old idea that wasn't working and sort of start with some new growth. So don't be afraid of those sorts of setbacks. I feel like when I was working on Song of Achilles, I would have these moments where I would think, well, that's it, I can't do it. You know, this means that I'm a failure as a writer as opposed to those setbacks aren't really setbacks. They're just part of the process of you figuring out your vision, finding your voice and getting it on the page. That's great advice. I love the idea of being just because you're in a perhaps on any given day, you might be in a negative deficit of words or pages. It doesn't mean you're not progressing. You yes. actually are moving forward. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, and go for walks. Go for walks out in nature if you can. Um, it's so helpful. Moving your body moves your brain. Um, looking at nature moves your brain, help, helps your brain think. There are studies that show that. So if you're really stuck, go for a walk. That's good advice, even um, outside of writing. Uh, <laughs> yes. It's a great way to sort of refresh. Uh, so Samara Williams has asked, what was the editing process like? It sounds like this was a very personal and intense book for you to write, one that's really resonated with readers. Um, you've answered a bit of that in, the, in your advice to writers. <laughs> um, but yeah. <laughs> but, you mentioned that it took a, a long time to write this. So what was the editing process like? Um, grueling, excruciating. No, it was, it was <laughs> um, about five years in, I had a completed manuscript of Song of Achilles. And I actually had an agent and I was thinking about moving towards publication um, or at least not, not towards publication, but trying to find publishers that, you know, that matched. And it was kind of mm, things were uh, that there wasn't a ton of interest. And, and, and I, so I decided to sit down and read the manuscript one more time. And I read it and I thought, oh no, this is terrible. Everything I wanted to do, I have not done. I completely missed the whole point of what I wanted this story to be. Um, unfortunately, I don't know how to fix it. And so around year five, I pulled it from submission. I ended up sort of getting rid of that entire draft, a draft that I had already spent five years working on oh. and sort of <laughs> starting over. And I was so, I can talk about it now, but at the time I was in despair and I, I decided to go to a writer's workshop um, and just sort of do like a two week writing workshop. But I was so depressed that I could not even take a fiction class. I had to take a nonfiction class because I didn't want to talk about, you know, what I saw as my failed novel. And while I was there, it was very inspiring to be around other writers. It was very inspiring to hear, you know, professional famous writers come in and talk to us. And as I was walking, walking across the, <laughs> the campus, um, I suddenly came up with the first line of Song of Achilles as it stands now. 
And, you know, my father was the king and the son of kings. And I ran back to my little dorm room and I typed up the first chapter, basically as it stands now with some, a little bit of editing, but basically as it stands. And then I closed my computer and I was like, okay, like I wanted to kind of keep it. It was like Pandora's box, like, keep it in there. <laughs> Don't let it out, I don't know what that was, but there's something there. Um, and so I, I, you know, when this was all over, I went back to it and, you know, that voice that I had found was still there. And what I realized is that although most of the story stayed the same, what really changed was Petroglos's voice. That in that first draft, I had given him an epic voice. I thought, well, this is an epic story. I was inspired by the Iliad. And so he had this very like Aragorn epic voice, completely wrong. And what I realized in that, in that moment was I needed him to have a voice that came out of the world of ancient lyric poetry that was much closer to someone like Sappho or Catullus that you know came from the world of love poetry and friendship and daily life, not huge things, but small things. Um, and that Patroclus gets kind of dragged into the world of epic because he loves Achilles, but that's not where he really lives. Um, and it's not where he wants to live. So it was all about voice and tone and diction. And that was sort of what needed to change. The other thing that needed to change was that I was afraid of dialogue. When I started writing, I was really frightened of it. And there's, there was almost no dialogue in that first version. And then I, but all that time that I was writing, I was also directing theater. And so I was around dialogue all the time because um, I was constantly directing scenes. I was reading plays and somehow that helped me get over my fear of dialogue. Now I love dialogue. There's dialogue everywhere, <laughs> all over my work. And so um, that was the other thing that changed as I sort of gained confidence in myself that you know, not only is dialogue really fun to write, it's so vital, so vital. That blows me away because if you could have said to me like why if, if I mean if I'm answering the question why do you think people fall so hard for the song of Achilles my answers would be this is a book that has the kind of dialogue that people get tattooed on their body <laughs> and the the voice Patroclus's voice is like the heart of this novel I'm like when you when I try and pick apart why why a romance is so like moving in this one it's because Patroclus's love for Achilles is so comes through so strongly in his viewpoint, but he himself, as a as a character, is so lovable <laughs> that you you never doubt why Achilles loves him. And I can't imagine this book told from any other viewpoint. Um, I'm like so. I know I said earlier when you said that don't give up, and I that I said I was really glad you hadn't given up. But hearing that. It took you five years and then you had to rewrite it all over again. I just want to reiterate, thank you so much <laughs> for not giving up because the end result is just so special. Um, and it, it seems like a lot of, lot of work went into that. <laughs> well, I couldn't, I couldn't give up on these characters. I, re I really couldn't. I felt like, I, what I felt like is I felt like I'd let Patroclus down. It's like, I know, I know, I can see your story. I'm sorry, I can't, I can't get your voice. And then finally, I felt like I stopped trying to impose, you know, I let him sort of talk. Yeah. Um, yeah. <sighs> now, um, Alan Prop has asked a question that I'm very interested in the answer to. And he asks, are there any updates on the movie miniseries rights for, I, I, I think he's talking about both the Song of Achilles and Circe in this case. Nothing right now for Song of Achilles. Um, Circe uh, for a while was gonna be with uh, HBO Max, but COVID hit and a lot of stuff ended up getting shifted around and changed and canceled and so no longer. But um, Circe is moving forward. Uh, I can't, I don't think I can say more than that, but hopefully in the next sort of couple of months, I should have I should have some more uh, information I can announce about that. But so Circe, Circe is, is going. Um, my dearest wish is for Song of Achilles to be a play. My, it's my theater roots. Um, I just, I feel like the intimacy of theater and the intimacy of Song of Achilles would go, would go well together. So maybe one day, maybe one day a play. Oh, I would love that. Um, so there are just now a few questions we're going to go back to my questions because I just have a few <laughs> questions that I, I still want to ask, just two. Um, so the, the first one is that I've seen some very tantalizing things from you online about stuff that you're working on. So I wanted to ask, are you able to tell us what's up next for you? 
Sure. So I, I thought if you had asked me three months ago, I would have said the Tempest, Shakespeare's Tempest. That's my theater. That's my theater training. And in particular, I loved Shakespeare. Um, but as I was working on the Tempest and, you know, speaking of that whole rewriting process, I have hundreds of pages of Tempest. Um, I suddenly started thinking about Persephone and the character really, it felt like that moment with, you know, both Circe and Patroclus where a character just kind of grabs hold of me. And I had never, you know, I loved the story, but I hadn't connected with it in that kind of deep way where I felt like I had something to say about it. And all of a sudden something sort of shifted and that opened up. And I feel like I do have something to say about that character and I, and I want to kind of live, live in her mind. Um, so I, I can't say too much more about it than that because I'm very superstitious about, <laughs> about what I'm working <laughs> on. Um, but it has been a joy to dive into that character and I'm really excited about it. Um, even though I'm, I'm sure I'm going to take forever because I'm a very slow writer. However long it takes, it will be worth the <laughs> wait. Um, so, oh, sorry, we've, we've just, we've had a question come in from Earl Santos that kind of ties into this. You may not be able to answer this. You can just say pass if this is something that you can't <laughs> answer because I know you're um, in the writing stages, but uh, he wanted to know, do you have a, a schedule in mind for the Persephone book? Like, do, when is this sort of, can we expect this out in the world or is it too early to say? Um, I have no, I have no schedule. I have no idea. And one of the things I do, and this is, I started this with Song of Achilles just because like no one was interested in buying Song of Achilles until it was finished. Um, but I usually write the entire book first because I, I, I don't work well under pressure. I really need to have all the time I need to kind of fiddle with stuff and go back over it and go back over it. Um, I have you know, wonderful publishers and I have some editors that I really love working with. So I feel like once I have a first draft, um, hopefully, you know, or once I have a, a solid draft, I won't say a first draft, a solid draft, <laughs> um, then then I, I will go to them and I have an incredible agent, Julie Bearer, who's, you know, wonderful about giving feedback on, on work. But I will say that once I kind of got the first line of Circe, it actually just was kind of a year, not even, it was, it was, you know, I had been fiddling around with Cersei and fiddling around with it, but from the time that I got the first line of Cersei to the time that I finished, it was actually nine months. It's just, there was this like long stretch of fiddling, <laughs> like mm -hmm. six years of fiddling before that. Um, so I, I will say that I think I have the first line. Um, so hopefully that means that I've done all the fiddling part and now I'm, now I'm, I'm going. In the strip, in the somewhat of a home stretch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the first line is really key for me. <laughs> well, Earl Santos and I, and I'm sure many other people listening are, are really pleased to hear that. I think I screamed when I saw that you were doing <laughs> the Hades and Persephone. I just couldn't imagine anything better. But I've also been very interested about your Tempest book for a long time. And like, again, this is a, this is a past question. You can, you can pass. <laughs> I, don't, I don't even expect you to answer it, but I'm just going to ask in case. Who would your POV be? in the Tempest? Or uh, it, it was Caliban, it was Caliban. <laughs> I, I have always loved the character of Caliban. I'm, I'm very interested in Miranda also, it's sort of the two children on the island, um, but Caliban is just unlike any other character in Shakespeare. I absolutely am just mesmerized. So uh, I was doing a lot, of, a lot of work with that character and also Miranda a little. I love, I love the sound of it. I look forward to it one day, <laughs> I, truly. Okay, so final question, wrap up time. Um, I think it kind of goes without saying that we're all deeply affected by the books we read, perhaps none more so than the books we read when we're young. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't read your book when I was young, but I feel like it's very much become a part of my like id, like as books do that, that you love. But there are so many young people at the moment with the way this book is trending on TikTok in particular, who are going to have the Song of Achilles as one of those cornerstone books that become a part of them in that way. And so I wanted to ask you, what were some of yours when you were young? Yes. Um, and 
I just want to pause and say for all the people who have taken this story into your hearts, thank you. Thank you. It is so meaningful to me um, because books were really a, a home for me when I felt very lost and adrift in the world. And so if my book is a home for someone else, that is really, it, I, it makes me, it renders me, it makes me speechless. <laughs> I feel like every time I tried to say, to say it, but thank you. Thank you. Um, the books that really affected me when I, there, there are a couple that really, really kind of took hold of me at, at different stages. Um, I absolutely loved Watership Down. I was in love with that book. I've read it so many times. It's such a comfort book. I come back to it. I read it again. And what I loved about it was the last hundred pages are incredible. I mean, first of all, it's very like Greek mythological. I mean, it's basically the Aeneid with rabbits. Um, <laughs> and it's so powerful. And it's just like the last hundred pages are just like a sprint to the end. And I remember thinking, you know, I want to write, if I can write an ending that's one day, that's one tenth as good as this, <laughs> you know, that has that kind of forward motion and that momentum. Um, so I loved that book. I loved, um, I loved The Hunchback of, of Notre Dame actually it was a really significant book. I read it when I was 13. I hit it at just the right moment. I mean, at least 50% of it went right over my head, but I feel like it, it was ultimately a story about injustice and the way that it talked about injustice was so powerful and sort of life-changing for me. Um, and the ending was so sad. I mean, I just wept like crazy when I got to the ending. Um, so that was that was a very formative book for me. It really kind of stuck in my mind. Um, Isabel Allende's House of the Spirits, I read when I was 14. I absolutely loved it. I, I didn't even know you could do that with fiction, what she did with it. Um, again, there's so much about injustice in that novel, um, but the magical realism elements. So I, I loved her work. I loved magical realism in general. Um, the, uh, the Joy Luck Club was another book by Amy Tan. I was so, I mean, the, I actually just reread it this past year and it was even more brilliant than I remembered. And I just, I remember every time I would read it, I would think, how does she do this? How is she telling these stories in such an amazing way? And then I would read it again. Um, and uh, The Bluest Eye, uh, Toni Morrison was another book, particularly when I was in, in high school, um, The Handmaid's Tale. These were books that were really powerful for me. Giovanni's Room, James Baldwin. Um, these were books that I, I read and reread and returned to and really sat with. So, yeah. What a reading list. Wow. <laughs> I'm like, I think we should, I, I want to put them together as a, as a reading list and put it to people. I love, I could hear you talk about your own books ad nauseum, but I love listening to you talk about the books that are, have been important to you in your life as well. Thank you for sharing that. Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, we're almost out of time. Now you can share your love for Madeline's novel with the hashtag, um, hashtag the song of Achilles day, if you want to join in our celebration today. And just remember to tag Cozy Books for the chance to get featured on our Instagram page. We'll also reveal some of our favorite quotes there and on our TikTok channel, just search Booktopia Books throughout the day. So you can reminisce or, you know, weep <laughs> along with us. Um, and Madeline, again, I just wanted to really thank you for your time. It's been such an honor for me to meet you and get to chat with you. I'm such a huge fan and I know many other people feel the same way. So thanks very much. Oh, thank you so much for your amazing questions, for being so gracious. Thank you, Booktopia. Um, and thanks to all of you readers out there for your questions. I loved, um, I wish we could all be together in person, but I'm really excited to get to do it this way. Well, maybe one day, maybe when, <laughs> maybe when, um, Persephone is ready and out in the world. <laughs> it might be a different world and we can um, see you in person. Uh, so thank you again. It's, it's been great to celebrate Song of Achilles Day with you um, 10 years on. And here's to another 10 years of people reading and loving this book. If you're keen to grab your own copy of the special anniversary edition, along with any of Madeline, Madeline's other editions of, of her books, all of which are beautiful, you can order your very own copies on now, online now at Booktopia. Thank you for watching and we'll see you next time.
Bye. Bye. Thank you.